Good morning, guys. Uh, I did this yesterday, had some technical difficulty. It didn't have any sound. I'd uploaded it to YouTube and had uh, thought everything was set, put it on canvas, and there was no sound. You saw me, you saw my lips move, you didn't hear a thing. Uh, so I had some technical issues with my microphones, but that should be fixed now. I've done a sound check, uh, and we've got that up and running. So today, welcome. Uh, I'm not for sure if we are going to go back to in-person classes or not at this point. I've had some questions from you all uh, in reference to can this be a virtual class. Now, there may be a time that you may have to come in, of course, with social distancing to do clinicals or to practice skills, to do demonstrations of your skills and those kind of things. Uh, this is a day-by-day -day thing for me. I don't understand how it's all going to work. I've not been, it's not been laid out for me. Uh, but we will get through this, and we will, I think we'll be successful at it. Um, and I was thinking, you know, I've got 15 students in the morning class. If I brought two in the, in, in the morning, two in in the evening, uh, I could easily go through uh, taking a two-hour period of time with social distancing and, and working with your skills to where we could get that accomplished and everybody, like in one skills week, everybody would be able to come in and work and you would in a safe environment. Uh, so those are things to look at. Safety, chapter 11, page 113 in your book. Um, since I lectured 40 minutes yesterday, and I know you didn't see that, uh, <laughs> I'm hopefully could condense it a little bit today since it's round two. But safety is a very integral part of what you do, keeping your residents safe, uh, and, that, and also your coworkers and yourself. Those are important. PPE, personal protective equipment, that's a term that you need to understand and to know about. Drink your coffee. That's a good start. All right. In on page 113, what do you need to know uh, in your book? Safety is a basic need in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Safety is right there. You're going to learn about Maslow as we study this book. Seems like we talked a little bit about Maslow in Intro to Health Science. Uh, if you didn't remember that, that's okay. We're going to cover it again. But safety is a basic need. And there's teams for safety. We remember we have a safety committee that does an inspection of our room once a month. And we're looking for hazards, and that's what we want to prevent illness and injury. Uh, we want to prevent disease processes by being safe. Uh, we do that in a number of ways. We have teams that look at our environmental safety. Uh, what are things in the area that could harm us? Uh, things that we might need to take care of, fall risk. Uh, one of the things in our safety inspection sheet, are the aisles cluttered? You know, are the exits blocked? Those are things that we're going to look at also in the workplace. Is there things that could cause an illness or an accident? Page 114, providing a safe setting. Uh, a hazard is anything in the person's setting that may cause illness or injury. And we want to prevent, we want to take care of hazards and we want to prevent illness or injury. Excuse me. No, I do not have COVID. I've had COVID um, <laughs> for the world to see, I guess. Um, and thankfully I survived it. Uh, very thankful for that. Hopefully I have some immunity, uh, that if I get it again, it will not be as, if I can, if I can get it again, of course, that's all up for debate. Uh, this is a work in progress. Uh, these are allergies, seasonal allergies. Knowing the difference is very important. All right. So if you look at page 114 at the bottom, we have teamwork and time management and providing a safe setting. Uh, I want you to look at that text. Everybody is responsible for safety. If you go into a room, you see a spill on the floor, you see something going on, you're responsible to take care of that. You don't want to see your patient or your coworker or yourself get uh, injured. So what do we do? We notify the charge nurse. We protect the area. Uh, we clean up the spill. If it's something just a little spill, we clean the spill up. Uh, that's part of what we do. Uh, accident risk factors. And these are, there are several. This is still on page 114 on the right-hand column. Age. Age is an accident risk factor. The older you get or the younger you are uh, can play a role in, in accidents and in risk. Awareness of surroundings. You've got to be aware of your surroundings and what's going on around you. Agitated and aggressive behaviors. Vision problems. Not being able to see well. Hearing loss. That can be a factor, a risk factor. Uh, impaired smell or touch. Uh, I can't, you know, like I can't taste, uh, is this food okay? Is, is this milk, is it, is it spoiled? 
Um, those can be risk factors if we if we have trouble with our with our taste and our smell. Uh, impaired mobility, medications medications can alter our perceptions, uh, can slow our reflexes. Uh, so those are things that we need to think about when that are also risk factors for an accident. One of the things that we do in a nursing facility is we have to identify the person. Uh, we want to give the right care to the right patient at the right time in the right manner. Uh, so there's a lot of rights there that we want to make sure that we're protecting and taking care of the patient. And identifying is our first step. We need to make sure that this is the patient that we're supposed to deal with. And if you work at a facility over a period of time, that's not a problem. You're going to get to know Mr. Johnson and Mrs. Sally and uh, Mr. Whoever. Um, you're going to get to know them, and you'll be able to on site. That's, that's who that is. But when you first go into a facility, or if you're in a facility that has a lot of changeover and you're coming on shift, uh, it might be difficult to know who's who. Uh, you may not know who the new resident is. Uh, in a hospital setting, of course, we have the arm bracelets. And when we go into a facility such as that, they'll say, you know, what's your name? Can you give me your date of birth? Uh, if we're dealing with someone who has a cognitive issue, an impairment, uh, they may not be able to tell us. We may say, hey, Joe, is that you? Or, hey, Mr. Joe, is that you? And they say, yeah. And that might not be Mr. Joe at all. Because of their cognitive impairment, they may say yeah, yeah to anybody or anything that you're getting ready to to, to, to do, uh, they may just want to be part of it and may think you're talking to them, may not have understood you or heard you. Uh, so those are things we have to identify a patient. And I know in facilities, we snap a picture. Uh, so that way, when you look at the treatment mar or the, the assignment sheet, you're able to see, hey, this is Mr. Joe. This is who Mr. Joe is. Um, so you want to make sure you have the right patient before you begin any procedure. I can tell you that, that I've had students um, uh, and, and also the right bed. You know, they may say, go in and uh, Mr. Joe needs a bath. And he's in bed too, one by the window. So you walk in and knock on the door. Hey, Mr. Joe. And the guy goes, hey. And you walk in and say, oh, time for your bath. And he's like, okay, I'm ready for this. Uh, and it's not Mr. Joe. Mr. Joe just happens to be in that bed. He, he was walking around, saw an open bed, got tired and laid down. May have not been Mr. Joe at all. So you want to identify the patient that you are that you are associated with uh, giving care to. Uh, very simple task. So identify the patient. That's the first thing in safety. Uh, preventing burns. Uh, anytime that we're dealing with water or hot liquids, uh, we or heat or cold applications, we want to pre prevent burns. Uh, first degree, second degree, third degree, first degree is superficial, second degree is partial thickness, third degree is full thickness. Uh, when we talk about burns, I think one of the telltale signs, when I think about a first degree burn, I think about a sunburn. Uh, when I think about a second degree burn, I think about blisters. Uh, when I think about a third degree burn, we've got loss, tissue loss. And when you get third degree and you get charred, there's not a lot of pain in certain areas of that because all the pain receptors are gone because of the damage that's been done by, by the burn. Uh, with water temperatures, we've got to check water temperatures. Uh, we always turn on the cold water first and then add hot water, and then we turn off the hot water first and then the cold water to prevent burns. Um, I used to work for the Office of Inspector General. Uh, Division of License and Regulation uh, in Healthcare. Uh, I worked. I worked a year in the field office in Lexington uh, and on the grounds of Eastern State Hospital, and then I worked in Frankfurt in, in training and quality assurance. And we would go out and we would ins uh, inspect and survey facilities uh, to see, see if they are in compliance with the regulations from the Commonwealth and also the regulations for uh, Medicare and Medicaid at the federal level. So we went to a facility. We drove to that facility. Uh, and as we got there, we went in and there was a very nice facility. Uh, went in and they had an administrative section. Of course, when we've been on a long trip, being, being inspectors, surveyors, we had to go to the bathroom. Of course, they graciously let us use the restrooms and I was one of the first to get to the bathroom. And I went to wash my hands. That's a good point. Always wash your hands after using the bathroom. Uh, and the, the water just about, the hot water just about scalded me. Uh, it was very hot. And so I told, as I come out, I told, told my fellow, uh, my peers, I said, you might be careful with the water. It's extremely hot. Well, the team leader come out, said it, and she said, that is hot. And I said, you know, do you think we have a problem here? And she said, well, this is the administrative part of the building. They may have a separate water heater. This was an add-on. Uh, this is the first time I've been in the facility. So this is, she understood. She'd been there a while. She said, this is an add-on. It may not be connected to the resident rooms. And thus, if it's administrative only and there's no patients, then 
then that's up to them. Uh, so when we started going through, we started looking at, we turned the, when we made our, our, our initial survey, we started turning the water on, and sure enough, it was hot. It was scalding hot. Uh, we made that aware, the facility aware of that, and they were able to take care of that. Uh, thankfully, there was no residents who got harmed with that. So anytime that you're dealing with water, uh, these are uh, facilities that, you know, they have regulators, they have monitors, and anything can go wrong. So, you know, you're just an extra eyes and ears checked. And you're going to check that water temperature to make sure that it's safe for the resident. We don't want anybody to get burned or be uncomfortable. Uh, we want to prevent poisons. We want to make sure that all the cleaners and stuff are, are put up. Uh, preventing suffocation. Uh, suffocation is when breathing stops from a lack of oxygen. Death occurs if the person doesn't start breathing again. It could be from drowning, choking, inhaling gas or smoke, electrical shock. Um, if you have someone who's in restraints, of course, restraints are not widely used now as they were in the 80s and early 90s. So that risk is decreased because we've recognized that restraints are, are not a good thing uh, and that we, have, we take other actions to, to help the patient uh, that <clears throat> may not create a, a, another danger to them. Um, but sometimes restraints are very necessary, uh, but those are one of the, one of the things that can occur. Uh, but we've, as far as choking, last year, let's make a connection. Safety and first aid, first aid, CPR, you have already practiced and demonstrated your proficiency in relieving a foreign body airway obstruction behind my maneuver, choking. So we, we will go again over that. That's one of the skills that we learn in, in the OMNA, even though we've covered it before. Uh, we, will, we will repeat that again this year uh, to make sure that we have, have those skills down in our mind. Uh, we learn and we remember Repetition is a great teacher. All right, so safety measures to prevent burns, safety measures to prevent suffocation. Uh, look at your surroundings. You want to make sure that, uh, that that area is safe for that resident and also for you. <coughs> Excuse me, page 117, safety measures to prevent poisoning, safety measures to prevent suffocation. I'm not going to read all this to you, but I'm pointing it out. as you, and you Actually, at this point, you should have already uh, looked at that. I'm just hitting some highlights here in the lecture. If you have questions, you can email me. You can send me a message uh, via Canvas, and we can answer that. And then, of course, when we're in person, as you're watching this video, if you want to write those questions down and uh, and save them for the in person, I'll be glad to take a look at that as well. Uh, so we talked about the relieving choking, uh, page 118, 119. Now, what if someone falls and gets cut? Uh, and they begin to hemorrhage. Hemorrhage is an excessive loss of blood in a short amount of time. Again, let's make the connection with our first aid and CPR training last year. Uh, with first aid, we learned how to apply pressure dressings. Uh, we learned how uh, or direct pressure, pressure dressing. We learned about elevation. We learned about pressure points. And we also learned about tourniquet. Hopefully, we don't have to use a tourniquet, but you have that knowledge. You have that skill set if it becomes necessary uh, to help control bleeding. Realizing that people are on anticoagulants. Uh, I know some people like me, I take an aspirin every morning. I've done that for several years. Uh, several years ago, my doctor recommended taking a, a daily aspirin, uh, 81 milligram baby aspirin, which has some anticoagulant properties. Uh, other people take heparin, Lovenox. So there are anticoagulants, uh, and I'm trying to think of the other one, uh, starts with a P, Clavitz. Uh, so we have to be careful with our patients because they have, in residents, they have, they're on these anticoagulants. Uh, preventing infection, safety, safety, uh, personal protective equipment, hand washing, keeping our area clean. Those are things that prevent infection. Preventing accidents with equipment. Uh, we don't want to overload page 120, 121. We don't want to overload plugs. If we see anything that's frayed or are broken in an electrical situation, we do. We want to call the, the charge nurse, let them know so they can call maintenance and take care of that. We don't want to use that. That's out of service until it's fixed. Wheelchair and stretcher safety, we want to make sure every part works. We want to make sure the brakes work especially. Uh, and I usually tell every class this. Uh, I was in my, in my beginning days at Pipeville Methodist Hospital back in the day, I was taking care of a patient. I was there. Excuse me. As a student nurse, and I have this gentleman, 
And he was a good size. I think that's the reason they assigned him to me. He was a good size gentleman, but I, he was able to, to stand and pivot. And so I stood and pivoted, put him in the in the in the bedside chair, and we were doing a, a bed bath. And I I taken care of the bed, and I had made the bed, cleaned the bed, uh, and we had finished him up. And he looked really good. It took me about forty five minutes. I was sweating. Uh, it was hot in that room. He was cold, so we turned the heat up to make him more comfortable. But I was melting down. Uh, so we got him all ready. Got him. He was he was he was in great shape. Uh, looked good. I picked him up, I pivoted him, and we sat down on the bed. But guess what I forgot to do? I forgot to lock the wheels on the bed. Uh, so I got him on the bed. When I did, he he laid back on the bed. The big dip began to roll. I laid on top of him, and we rolled all the way to the wall. And he laughed the entire time. <laughs> it, it, it's funny now. It wasn't at the time. Uh but he, he now he was alert oriented. He had he he didn't have any cognitive impairment. He just he had an illness uh, that uh, uh, physical illness that 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 made him need the assistance that he that he needed. Uh, and he just he laughed. He cackled and he laughed. And uh, so I, I was able to stand him back up uh, and put him. You know, I had to get the chair over, put him back in the chair, got him moved. Uh, Rolled the bed back, made sure that it was locked, fixed everything again, and then we transferred him. Uh, and you might say, well, those of you who are not as old as I am, if you're watching this, uh, you might say, well, Mr. Justice, especially if you're nurses, where's your sit to scan lift? Where was your Hoyer lift? Where was your two and three and four person assist? In 1980, well, I ain't going to go far, too far, but in 1988, uh, we didn't have a lot of those things, uh, and we we just we just it was our physical strength. We we just picked them up. We we did what we needed to do for the patient. Uh, but I, I I remember that, and now I can tell you from that experience in '88, uh, I don't remember a case after that that I did not uh, lock the bed, make sure that bed was locked and those wheels were locked, uh, whether it's a wheelchair or a bed. Uh, that taught me a lesson. Uh, thankfully, nobody was hurt. <laughs> the patient seemed to enjoy it. <laughs> I can still in my mind hear him laughing and cackling. Uh, and, uh, 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 and and he wasn't scared at all. I, I was I was more scared than he was, and no one was hurt. So we were very blessed in that aspect. Uh, just a little history there. Uh, so when we when we, we want to make sure the beds, stretchers, and the wheelchairs, anything that's movable that's locked during transfers, uh, and that's in working order. So let's look at page 121, wheelchair and stretcher safety. Uh, there's a green box there. Again, I, I'm just pointing that out to take a look at that. Handling hazardous substances. A hazardous substance is any chemical in the workplace that can cause harm. Now, we have, in, a, in one of my prior videos, you have the right to know uh, center here as you go through the door. On the right, all the MSDS sheets. And each facility has those MSDS sheets, okay? Uh, so to, that way, if you come in contact with something, they're able to look that up and tell you uh, information about that and how, if you become exposed, what to do, what are the steps. If you don't have an MSDS sheet, you can call Poison Control, and they can also give you information related to that. Everything needs to be labeled. That's, that's very important. We don't want a bottle with, we don't know what's in it. Uh, moonshine. Uh, you know, you got glass bottles, you, it looks like water. You, you smell of them, they smell like moonshine. Uh, but we were, you know, you can't tell, but by looking at it, you can't tell. Uh, we kind of kid now during the COVID, COVID, you know, if we did what we did uh, a year ago uh, when an officer pulled us over, what, what happens? We got, we got a mask on our face. Uh, we only roll our window down this much, and we smell of alcohol because we had to use alcohol to make hand sanitizer. So, so they, can smell, they can smell the alcohol. We got our face covered, and the officer walks up to the window, and there we are. Uh, Kind of funny how things change, but we want to take safety measures. Uh, we don't want, we do not want uh, uh, containers that are not labeled. We need everything labeled uh, for the safety. Employee training that happens when you first come in. That's the reason we're doing the safety training at the beginning of class. Uh, this class started. We did safety. Uh, we've continued to work on our safety training. Um, honestly, if we'd have been in person, we would have been done by now. 
it's taken with the tech. You know, I just got a new computer uh, Friday. Had technical issues, uh, technical issues before. This is a work in progress. Uh, but every component of what we do, we have to make sure that it's safe. Uh, so when we talk about safety, we talk about employee training, train you to be safe, fire safety, the use of oxygen. Uh, oxygen is one of the components necessary to have a fire. Uh, you got to have fire, you got to have a spark, you got to have fuel. You take any of those away, you don't have a fire. Uh, so we have to be careful with those people who have oxygen therapy as well. Fire safety, uh, preventing fires is important. We do not use wool blankets for fires. Uh, or, I'm sorry, wool blankets if oxygen is in use because they can create sparks. We want materials that will decrease static electricity. Also, just as a side note, everything generally in a room or in a hospital or a nurse home is fire retardant. Uh, it's been specially designed to decrease the risk of fire in a long-term care facility, except what's been brought from the family and the patient resident when they come in. Uh, those may not be as flame retardant as, uh, as what we have in the facility. But we want to prevent fires. Remember, we're going to use the acronym RACE, Rescue, Alarm, Confine, and Extinguish, or Evacuate. Uh, you've seen where the, where the fire extinguishers are here in the room and where the pool stations are. Uh, so, but we want to use the acronym RACE. So we're going to rescue anybody in the immediate area. We're going to get them out. We're going to close the door to confine it. We're going to evacuate the adjacent rooms, you know, uh, race, we're going to rescue immediately, we're going to alarm, we're going to confine, we're going to confine the room, we're going to evacuate the adjacent rooms, and generally where you see double doors in a facility, that's, that's a firewall. There's generally a two-hour burn-through time in a firewall, so you're going to want everybody past the firewall, and then you want to extinguish if you're able to extinguish that. I tell nursing assistants, keep your water pitchers full. If somebody puts something in a garbage can or you have a little trash fire, that water pitcher can be used, dump it right in that, right in there, you take care of the fire very quickly. What you do in the first five minutes will, will determine the course of the next five hours in a fire emergency. So uh, I know in the facility that I was director of nursing in in Danville, Kentucky, Charleston Healthcare Center, uh, our policy is, or, or was, it's, it still may be, is that when there was a fire or a report of a fire, uh, rescue. We put, everybody pulled out of that room. We shut the door. We then moved everybody. We alarmed. Now that's an we alarm. We're not going to run down and say, fire, fire, everybody's going to die. No, no, we don't want to do that. Um, we don't want to scare other residents, uh, staff, uh, but we want to say we have a fire here and we pull the alarm and then we want to activate our procedures. Notifying, calling 911. Even if you have an automatic system, we had an automatic system in Danville. <laughs> That when our fire alarm went off, it notified uh, the city of Danville Fire Department. And they, there was a, they were a full-time fire department, so in three to seven minutes, we had help. Um, so that's something, if you live in an in a area, in a city area, has a full-time fire department, you pull the fire alarm, you know you're going to get help fairly quickly. Uh, our volunteers are excellent in, in our communities uh, uh, to respond to, to emergencies, even if we don't have a, uh, a full-time fire department in those areas. But understand that they're, they're volunteers, so they may be a little farther out. They're not standing at the station waiting for a call necessarily, uh, so it may take a little longer. So we've evacuated. In our facility, it was the responsibility for one nurse on, one, on each hall. We had three hallways, uh, A, B, and C. Uh, but wherever the fire was, there would be one person left on that hallway and all the fire extinguishers were to be brought to the area of the fire. Uh, so that way we could help extinguish using our, our fire extinguishers. Now, I showed you our fire extinguishers during this prior safety video. We use the pass system, pull, aim, squeeze, and sweep. Uh, the red ABC can be used on any type of fire. If you have a silver extinguisher, the old extinguishers, some facilities may still have those, that's a water extinguisher. That's only on paper and wood. You don't put that on grease. You don't put that on electrical. The electricity can actually come back through the water and shock you. Uh, so that's something that you need to be aware of. You do not use uh, a water extinguisher on an electrical fire. Uh, and then if it's a, uh, a gas or a, a grease fire or a gas fire or something, water just kind of just can just push it around. Uh, you need a, a type of foam or a, a, a dry chemical would work would work well on on that.
So you'll see those, page 124, 125. And then also talking about carries to evacuate people from the facility uh, or from the area. Uh, you've got one person carry, two person carry, uh, the blanket drag, if you've got someone who's totally immobilized or unable to help you. Uh, basically, you protect the head of the neck, you use the blanket or the undercovers, and you slide them to the floor, and then you slide, excuse me, you slide them out of the room. Disasters. Disaster is a sudden catastrophic event. People are injured and killed. Property is destroyed. Uh, natural disasters include tornadoes, hurricanes. We've seen Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, the recent hurricanes. They affect health care facilities as well. Sometimes those facilities cannot evacuate and they have to shelter in place. And they need staff to do that. Uh, so you've got to, we're not a furniture company. We just can't shut the line down. Uh, we've got to take care of our residents and our facilities. So those are things uh, things to think about and disasters. Bomb threats? Who's going to be looking for the bomb? You are. Now, you might say, Mr. Justice, you are crazy. But let's, let me, let's look at this room for a second, uh, this room that, that, that I teach in. Uh, since this is my morning class, you've, been, you've sat here for an entire year prior, almost a year. We got shut out for COVID and flu and different things for a while. But you understand this room. At some point, I've touched every piece of equipment. I've cleaned this room. I've moved this room around. I know what's here, what should be here, and what shouldn't be here. So the first pers person to do a sweep during a bomb threat should be me. Because I can walk through and I can look. Is there anything out of place? Is there something there that I do not recognize or have not seen before? And then I'm out of there. And then I'm going to say, hey, I don't know what this is. There's a backpack. I don't know who left it. It's not normally there. It's located here. Or there's this box. I don't remember it putting it there, you know. So that just kind of lets the personnel who have more experience with that kind of thing to know, hey, maybe we need to look here first. Uh, workplace violence, it's a violent act, uh, including assault, threat of assault directed toward persons at work or while on duty. Uh, sadly, uh, we, we are helpers. Uh, nurses are helpers, doctors are helpers. We're, we're, there. we're there because generally we want to be and we have a passion to help people. We have a hard time understanding why people don't want help or would want to harm us because we want to help. There's some crazy people out there. Uh, so understand that we have procedures to keep ourselves safe. Uh, facilities have procedures. Uh, from, from the time that you go to work and you park in that parking lot, be aware of your surroundings. Look around. And actually, we have, if you look on page 128, 129, we have measures to prevent or control workplace violence and also personal safety practices to put in place. Become familiar with that. If there's something in the bottom of your gut and you're, you're worried about something, you need to notify somebody. Uh, if somebody in a certain room is not acting right, let your charge nurse know. Maybe they need to call security or the police, uh, and the charge nurse will be able to assess that and make that decision. Risk management involves identifying and controlling risks and hazards affecting the center. There's generally a person or a team of persons who will look at the risk uh, as to why something occurred and what can we do. Uh, what If we change a procedure and we can prevent an injury or an illness, then that's definitely what we want to do. Uh, 130, 131. Uh, one of the things it mentions code colored wristbands like for different things. We can't just write, hey, he's a DNR. Uh, that's a violation of HIPAA. But what we can do is we know that if he has a purple bracelet, it doesn't say anything, but the color purple, because we are allowed to know that because we take care of them. Uh, but we don't want everybody to know that. But we know that purple is a do not resuscitate. So then when we see a purple bracelet, we understand that. But that doesn't, anybody else, they just say that might be just a pretty color. Uh, if it's red, it may have an al be an allergy. Hey, there's an allergy here. We need to check the chart to see what that allergy is. Maybe to shellfish, maybe to peanuts, maybe to chocolate. Uh, yellow may be fall risk. So as you read that, understand. Now, personal belongings and incident reports are the last two things in this chapter we're going to talk about. Uh, when we talk about uh, inventory lists or personal belongings, we want to care for those belongings as if we're, they're our, our own. Uh, we, we want, they have ascribed value to them and they mean something to them, and we want to care for them. We don't want them to lose that. Uh, if they're admitted in the facility, when we write that inventory list, we're going to describe what they brought in the facility. If it's anything of major value, we're going to ask them to take that home or put it in the safe. Facilities do have safes to care to keep those things for the for the resident or the patient, uh, because we'd hate to see them lose that. Things get lost. Uh, and, you know, they say, well, they just steal up there. Well, how easy is it 
And I, you know, my grandmother would take her rings off uh, and set them on the bedside at night. Uh, if you, so if you're in a hospital or you're in your room in a, in a nursing facility and you do that, well, where's your trash can? Could be really close. Uh, those could be knocked off in there, go out in the trash. Nobody stole them, but they're still just as gone. Uh, so think about those things. You, we want to, or they get in the bed linens. They slide because of weight loss. They slide off the hands. They're in the bed linen. They roll up, they go to laundry, you know, and then they end up in the washing machine. Uh, and they're damaged, or the dryer. So we want to make sure that uh, that we take, help them take care of their personal belongings, and we don't want to see them lose those. Uh, as far as incident and accident reports, anytime there's an incident or accident report, that immediately to the charge nurse. The charge nurse has forms to fill out accident and incident reports, so those are important. Now, page 134, 135, I've had questions already about, what about the review questions at the end of the chapter? Uh, Mr. Justice, do we have to do those? I, I would like for you to read those and see if you can answer the questions. Now, the answers are located in Appendix A uh, in your book. In the back of the book, there's answers to every question uh, at the review questions. Sometimes, hint, hint, I will use these questions as test questions or quiz questions. So be aware of that. So if you've already read it, you already know the answer, and it, it helps part of the learning process. Honestly, I don't think this lecture was as good as yesterday's. Uh, but this is it. Uh, so safety. Safety is an important, integral part of your job. It's to protect you, the residents, and your coworkers, as well as visitors and family that may be visiting. And it's something that we take very seriously. Uh, so hope you enjoyed the lecture, or endured the lecture. Uh, I'll be putting up another lecture soon. Uh, we'll do another chapter. Remember that by Thursday of this week, which will be today's 9-15, 15th day, Tuesday, of September 2020. So on Thursday, your book work is due. Remember that if you, after I get your book work, you just need to submit pictures that it is filled out. You do not sit, submit that to the group pages. They have to be submitted individually uh, because I'm working on trying to, to keep our, our integrity as far as uh, doing our own work. Now, it's not. there's nothing wrong with asking a question. Hey, I can't find this question. Where did you find it? That's that's perfectly fine, except on a test. I want to know what you know, not what everybody else knows. Uh, but on your workbooks and those kind of things, it's all right to ask for help. But just to, just to copy word for word, uh, that doesn't help you at all. Uh, you need to, need to put your own effort into that. Uh, and we don't want to put that on the group page for everybody to see. Now, after Thursday, I'll be looking to make sure everybody submits their work. Now, usually, probably by Sunday or Monday, I will put the answers up. They'll be probably Monday. The answers will be up uh, to grade your own work and to give me your uh, grade, and I will put it in Canvas and also in Infinite Canvas. Now, if you've not turned in your work by then, you're going to take a 15% hit. That means if you got every question right, you're only going to make 85%. Uh, and that's just to keep the integrity of the, the grading system uh, because it would not be fair for someone who worked really hard getting every question and then somebody come up and just copy the answers from what Mr. Justice had posted and make sure they got all the right answers. Um, so the first time that's going to be a 15% hit, the most you can make is a B. All right. And then, of course, next time if that occurs on a, on a continuing basis, we're going to go from 15 to 30%. Uh, you, the most you can make, even if you got every answer out, would be a C. And then after that, it's going to go 40%, a D. And then if you turn in your work light, you will get points, but it'll be at a 50%. It'll never go down below 50%, but over a period of time, it's to encourage you to get your work in. Now, if you're having technical issues, and believe me, I understand technical issues, uh, we can work with that. I will, I will hold on posting the, the answers, uh, but I need to know that. You need to communicate that with me. Well, guys, today's Tuesday, 15th day of September. Uh, this is a lecture on MNA, Long-Term Care, Chapter 11. Uh, if you have any questions, again, email me. Uh, send me a message in Canvas. I'll be glad to answer those. Uh, the next video that I will be putting up will not be to MNA. It will be to Medical Math. So that should be coming up, and you'll have an assignment in your Medical Math book. Guys, have a great day.